Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to those of you who are here with us in the Interchurch Center, and to those of us, those of you who are watching the webcast of this event on YouTube or Google Plus Hangouts. My name is Taylor Burton Edwards. I serve currently as the chair of the consultation of Common, Common Text, which is the host of this event today. In the consultation on Common Text for several years now, we've been wondering among ourselves what's going on with lectionaries beyond our own. And so we wanted to host an opportunity for people who have been involved in the development or the promotion of other lectionaries or people who've been involved in using other lectionaries in the past to have the opportunity to have that conversation. What's going on with lectionaries right now? Why are people using the ones they're using? Why, are, why have other lectionaries been developed over time? What's the core idea behind the way that texts are chosen and arranged for particular purposes? What does this say about the nature of the worshiping communities that use them? What can we learn from each other that might strengthen our own projects, but ultimately strengthen the entire body of Christ as together, all of us, using perhaps a variety of approaches to patterns for proclamation, seek to proclaim the one gospel of our one Lord and Savior. This morning, we will have uh, four presenters. The one-year lectionary that will be presented by Will Whedon of uh, the Wisconsin, uh, sorry, LCMS, Lutheran Church, uh, Missouri Synod. Uh, the lectionary for Mass, which uh, is the, in some ways, kind of the Roman Catholic predecessor to the Revised Common Lectionary, and remains the standard lectionary used around the world in the Roman Catholic Church by Monsignor Alan Detcher. The Revised Common Lectionary by Fritz West, and uh, the Year D Project by Tim Slemons, who developed the Year D Project. We'll have a few remarks just before lunch and dismiss for lunch at noon. Uh, lunch is downstairs uh, in the cafeteria here. And we will resume in here at 1.10 p.m. with a presentation on the African-American lectionary from Martha Simmons and the narrative lectionary from Carolyn Lewis. This will be followed by a panel discussion in which uh, you will be able to ask your questions uh, here in the room, as well as we'll take those questions that come in through our Google Plus Hangouts channel and on YouTube, and um, have some more conversation together about what we have done with lectionaries and what we can all learn from each other. Um, we will conclude our time together at 3 p.m. Thank you again for your presence presently here or virtually here. And uh, let me simply introduce our first presenter uh, for the one-year lectionary, Will Wheaton of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And a voice said, cry out. And I said, what am I supposed to cry out? I mean, because all flesh is grass. And all this glory is like the, the, the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the spirit breath of Yahweh blows on it, the voice answered, the grass does wither, and the flower does fade. But the davar Elohim, but the word of our God endures to the ages. What should I preach is the perennial question that a preacher asks, having been told by God to cry out and having been put into the cry outer office. In answer, the church hands over to the preacher a set of readings on which to base that crying out. The content of the crying out is always and again to wrap the people of God in the word that endures to the ages. 
the word of the Lord that was made flesh and withered like grass and faded like the flower only to rise in unfading glory and beauty to endure forever. The crucified yet risen Lord is the one we cry out. We preach the human flesh and blood that was impelled by the spirit of Yahweh to taste death for all in order to give life to all. And we sing that he lives forever, triumphant in love, that neither sin, death, nor any enemy could ever defeat. All right, Whedon, you weren't sent here to preach, so get with it already about the historic series. I know, I know. But we need to understand, first of all, the point of any lectionary to understand why my Senate thought that the historic lectionary was something that we might not want to relegate to the already overly stuffed attic of liturgical antiquities and curiosities. The thing at its core is old. The first witness we have of the Western Church's Sunday feasting on these readings comes from the Comes of Würzburg, 6th century. But it clearly was just listing out what had already been developing and going on in the years before. We have no clue how much before. There are elements that hint at a gradual transformation from the earlier Lectio Continua. And I think we might even suppose that the filling in of the church year kind of put the breaks on the Lectio Continua as you had one festival after another having its own set of readings. Pretty soon you lost the inner logic of the Lectio Continua entirely. You can observe, by the way, the same feature in the Eastern Church, which to this day uses a one-year lectionary, not the same as the Western Church's one-year lectionary. <laughs> Alcuin revised the Würzburg, or at least quite similar to it, for the Carolingian court, and he passed it on. It sprouted up all across Europe, though not exactly in lockstep. It's one of those pieces of shared heritage that survived the fracturing of the Reformation, so that you had Lutherans and Anglicans and Roman Catholics still having the same basic set of readings they were working on, if you think about it. Although Trent revised it slightly, what, what you have here is, <laughs> it is an amazing set of readings that John Donne and St. Thomas Aquinas and uh, uh, St. Bernard and Martin Luther, they all, they all preached on them. If you want to see how nicely it all holds together, go to www.lectionarycentral.com. And some wonderful Anglican has put together the resources there that are free. Um, and you can find on a given day, where, where did the church fathers write on this text? Where did the great Carolingian divines write on this text? The reformers, etc. You get a feel for it. <laughs> Even Newton, and you can check, uh, Newman rather, and you can check him out before and after the swim. Um, but... We come to know a person, not by knowing his or her biographical details. We come to know a person only when we know the stories that they tell over and over again. And if we're attentive, we might even note that the stories evolve with time. And we can say we know a person well when we're so familiar with their repeated stories that they inhabit us and shape us and that we share their interior world. Think about the Bible. God's spirit blew on flesh and flower. And the result was that the stories of his people and of God cohered. It's a gift. Through those stories, you can come to know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as persons. And their stories inhabit you and shape you and mold you just as knowing the stories of a dear friend or spouse ends up changing you from the inside. Their stories reach out to enfold you and transfigure you. The historic lectionary arose to help the preacher answer the perennial question, what am I supposed to cry out this time? 
It arose specifically as a guide to help the preacher in entering into deeply and unpacking for the people certain key stories of God by which God would enfold them into his own embrace and open to them the depths of his heart and the crucified, risen, returning Lord. All the scriptures are given us for this purpose, of course. That's why the Lord Jesus can make that brash claim about Moses and all the prophets testifying of him. But not all the stories do it with the same degree of clarity or to the same degree. So when the lectionary question confronted my synod back when we were preparing our latest worship book, Lutheran Service Book 2006, henceforth LSB, one question we were confronted with was, what are we supposed to do with this historic lectionary? The question was, do we simply allow the historic lectionary to disappear up the stairs into the liturgical attic? Or might that lectionary, though antique, actually prove serviceable to the needs of Christ's church in this day and age, as it has for the last thousand and more years? Can a parish thrive using a smaller set of readings to enfold the people of God into his story? Our answer was to note that the good inherent in the lectionary might outweigh the disadvantages of having parishes be so out of step, not just with so many of our own sister parishes, but with such a wide scope of the church right now in the Western world. Though I must note, the, the one-year lectionary has had an uptick with the continuing Anglicans insisting on the lectionary in the book, the, the, the 1928 Book of Common Prayer, and, and another uptick with the... Uh, Sumorum Pontificum that permitted any Roman priest to celebrate the, uh, the old Latin mass, which of course relies on this lectionary. So there's synchronic unity, but there's also diachronic unity. Unity through the ages, unity in time that way. And the Synod thought, you know, rather than, as Chesterton said, let's not disenfranchise the dead. Rather than disenfranchising the dead, let's let them at least have a vote. Let's let that heritage continue. So in the introduction to our lectionary volumes, we have these words. Early in the process, the decision was made to recover and retain the historic lectionary as used by Luther and subsequent generations of Lutherans and as included in the Lutheran hymnal, which was our 1941 resource. Although the lectionary committee acknowledged that relatively few LCMS congregations use the one-year lectionary, the committee concluded that such a lectionary should be included in the hymnal to serve both those who still customarily use it and those who one day may find their situation could best be served by the repetition inherent in this lectionary. Among the various reasons for retaining a one-year lectionary then, the lectionary committee noted the following. One, we're a historic church and we acknowledge the value of what has been handed down to us. And as they did their research, there was just not a lot of reflection in the Missouri Synod on the change to the three-year. It happened overwhelmingly fast, overnight. Um, and everybody was on board, and the reflection on it seemed to come almost a generation later. So, for what it's worth. To also recognize the value of repetition, given the increasing lack of biblical literacy within our society and even within the church, there may be a need in the future for a one-year lectionary with its annual repetition of key biblical texts. And thirdly, the one-year lectionary is unique in that there are numerous older resources that support it, including the hymnody, sermons by Luther and others, and so on. Three basic points then. Yet, the experience with the three-year totally convinced us that you just couldn't take the one year and offer it by itself. Do you remember, how many of are you in this room lived with the one year at one time? Okay, so you might remember then in your youth hearing a, a pastor announce on Christmas, the epistle for Christmas from the 60th chapter of Isaiah. We had that. In the Missouri Synod, for a time, we also had the uh, the epistle reading for the day of St. John, the evangelist coming from 
uh, some chapter in Sirach. Um, our people have been blessed by the restoration of the Old Testament readings in the divine service. And so taking the cue from the way that the three year dealt with that originally, we, we did the same thing. Quote again from our, our introduction to the lectionary. We, the, the, the Old Testament readings for the day were to relate closely to the Holy Gospel by way of typology or prophetic connection. In addition, the committee attempted to provide a balanced selection from the various genres of the Old Testament readings, um, prophetic, historical narrative, etc. And uh, they, with that, they also provided the responsorial psalm, if, if that was desired. Though with the one year, they also tried to save the introits. So those little snippets of verse that you had at the beginning of the service years ago, the single verse from the psalm gave you what psalm you're to draw from. We just added more verses to that, but left the traditional antiphons on either side. Same with, with the gradual and the tracks. And they're all pointed for easy congregational singing. In this lectionary, because the Sunday readings are fixed, each came each day came to have its own import. Example, anybody know what yesterday was in the old way of thinking? Cantate. Cantate Sunday was the Sunday that celebrated the church's song. Smack dab in the middle of the Easter season every year. It was a day when the choir would especially give some really great stuff to the congregation. And it had this, the, the intro, uh, Cantati Domino Canticum Novum from, from Psalm 98 or 96. Uh, the glorious collect, asking God to make us love what he commanded and desire what he promised. So among the countless changes of this world, our hearts would be fixed where true and lasting joys are to be found. Um, so that's a regular in, in the one year. Each of the Sundays has its own feature. And with the one year that you get your purpose for that rose candle, in Advent, which otherwise is just kind of lost and floating out there, right? You know, not the fourth Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent, Gaudete, the Sunday when the intro, it shouts out, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. The Lord is at hand. The fast is almost over. Christmas is almost upon us. Uh, and there's tons of customs in the church that were associated with each of these days. Um, one more thing to think of in that regard, Lent, Lent. Uh, a, a, a training ground for the Christian journey. So the first Sunday in Lent, of course, that stays the same, the, the, the temptation of Jesus. The message being, you have an enemy who likes to pray around like a friend. But the second Sunday in Lent in the historic series, the Canaanite woman, you also have a friend who sometimes comes across to you like an enemy. Don't buy it. Hold tight to him. It continues to develop this, this entire way. What about some of the famous om omissions? Trinity Sunday. John 3, 1 to 15? 15! Seriously. Uh, well, that's easy enough to fix, right? So we just added on, well, you can go 16 and 17 if you want to, and even further if you want to, yet you don't want to lose John 3, 16. What about the third Sunday after Trinity when you read always the first two parables of Luke 15? What about the last parable in Luke 15? That was provided as an option on that day. Um, similarly, in, in Lent 4, Lactare, um, another one of those rose days in the church. You can read Paul's reflections on his travails in 2 Corinthians, or you can read Acts 2, which actually reflects the idea of Jesus feeding his people a little bit better, that the, the feeding of the 5,000 is the, the theme that day. Um, one unfortunate complication, of course, is that the, um, having two church years uh, results in parishes not celebrating some of the feasts on the same day. Lutherans have this peculiarity in, in Germany and America that we celebrate transfiguration at the end of Epiphany, not, not on August 6th in the summer. Um, and so in some of our parishes, they're using the one year, they're celebrating transfiguration three weeks ahead. And when the school goes over to sing it, you know, another place and they go, wait a minute, we just did that three weeks ago. What are you doing? What's the point of, 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 of pre-Lent? Well, pre-Lent actually enabled us to reflect on if, we're, if Lent is the journey to the Paschal mystery, isn't it better to prepare for a journey instead of being like Bobo Baggins and running out of the house without your kerchief? Um, you know, how do you prepare 
for a journey to the cross. That's what uh, pre-Lent was designed to, to accomplish. It also introduces the pain of what do you do with this, the sun, what are they called? The Sundays after Trinity. Um, that's what they're called in the one year, the Sundays after Pentecost. Still, we use that, even though we'd still have the, the ordinary, we still bother to say what it is after Pentecost. And the one oddity that I still haven't been able to figure out is they retained the traditional date for the visitation of June or July 2nd, which puts it, you know, <laughs> a week after the nativity of St. John the Baptist on the 24th, which uh, there are plenty of, of, of other moments like that in, in, the, in the calendar, though. So, so real briefly, some of the concerns. Oh, wait a minute. Are you saying you have to preach the same text over and over and over again? Can you tell me when we're out of time? Yeah, hold you. Okay, just wave at me. Yeah. Um, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the thing that uh, Lea, the great Lutheran theologian of the 19th century, said, no, you see, when you want to teach people, you need to start with what they know. So if you have a set of texts that everybody knows, then from those texts, you can unpack the entirety of the faith. And you can pull other passages in and you're building on what they know because they all know them. I personally preached on them for years and find I'm not the same person I was the last time I had this this text the year before. So my journey continues and my hearing of that always uh, hopefully deepens. Uh, what about not respecting the genius of each of the evangelists? Well, there's no reason you, you shouldn't do that. So you're preaching on transfiguration and you're in the one year series, you're going to have Matthew's text. Don't punt to Luke and bring in, well, they were talking about the Exodus, and that's the big, that's not the big thing, Matthew. So when you're preaching that one, you don't have to bring that in. You can say it. Well, you know, that's what Luke says they were talking about. But in Matthew, the big point is, hear him. Um, in summary, I think about 10% of our parishes now utilize this one-year series, seeing a small but steady growth. It came into the 21st century with its own Facebook pages, one devoted to preachers, one devoted to musicians who are working on it. And I wish I had time to develop. I, I, I have not totally figured this out, but I think that a lot of what happened musically in our churches across the board was that a shift in lectionary caused the music that was written for the lectionaries no longer to quite fit. And we've been struggling. We're still trying to play catch up to get the music to actually proclaim the texts that uh, we're reading in, in our, our three year series. Uh, some great work being done, but uh, a lot more to go. The strength of the historic series, in my view, is simply it's uh, coherence with the human experience that repetition is the mother of learning. Or as the uh, Loyola and proverb said, non multa sed multum, not many, but much reading is the key to learning. Um, think back to the point about stories and coming to know a person. You really know someone when you can sort of fill out the stories about them. Let's be honest here. That Ben and I killed a lion and a cistern on the day when the snow fell is not the same way as knowing that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and saw what he had made and declared it good. Um, they're different weight. And so just making sure that people know about, uh, you know, the lion and the cistern on the day the snow fell is not the goal of, of the lectionary. What should I cry out? The one year suggests that you cry out the self-same word made flesh, but do so on the basis of a smaller set of stories with which the people of God can become intimately familiar, sort of a foundation on which the rest of their growing knowledge of the word can rise up. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Our second presenter this morning is Monsignor Alan F. Detcher, and uh, he will be presenting on the order for the readings for the Mass, the Ordo Lectionum Missae. Since most of you don't normally have access to the introduction to the Roman lectionary, I have printed two parts of it here so that uh, on your leisure you can look at what it really says rather than listening to me. As Will mentioned, some of us grew up using the old cycle of readings. 
But the problem for a Roman Catholic was the readings were all in Latin. So you really didn't hear them. The priest said them uh, in a low voice at the altar. 99% of the people didn't understand the Latin that was used. And probably 90% of the priests didn't either. There were hand missiles that contained the texts, but many people said the rosary or private prayers and really didn't pay attention to the readings. In my experience in my home parish in Greenwich, uh, the gospel was always read in English just before the sermon, which was a sermon. And uh, the reading from the epistle was never read, which meant Roman Catholics heard the gospel, 50 some odd passages of it, and that was it. Along comes the Second Vatican Council. And the Second Vatican Council shook up a lot of things. The first document of the council was the Constitution of Sacred Liturgy. And if I just read you a few small passages where it talks about what the church, the Catholic Church, needs to do. Sacred scripture is of the greatest importance in the celebration of the liturgy. It is from the scripture that the readings are given and explained in the homily, that psalms are sung, the prayers, collects, and liturgical songs are scriptural in their inspiration. It is from the scriptures that the actions and signs derive their meaning. Thus, to achieve the reform, progress, and adaptation of the liturgy, it is essential to promote that warm and living love for scripture to which the venerable tradition of both Eastern and Western rites give testimony. It's number 24. In number 35, the intimate connection between words and rites may stand out clearly in the liturgy because the spoken word is part of the liturgical service. In sacred celebrations, there is to be more reading from Holy Scripture, and it is to be more varied and opposite. The blessed place for spoken word uh, that is consistent with the rite is to be indicated even in the rubrics that the ministry of preaching is to be fulfilled with exactitude and fidelity. Preaching should draw its content mainly from the scriptural and liturgical sources being proclaimed of God's wonderful works in the history of salvation. The mystery of Christ, ever present and active within us, especially in the celebration of the liturgy. It's number 35, 1 and 2. In number 51, the treasures of the Bible are to be opened up more lavishly so that a richer share in God's word may be provided for the faithful. In this way, a more representative portion of the Holy Scripture will be read to the people in the course of a prescribed number of years. 52. By means of the homily, the mysteries of the faith and the guiding principles of Christian life are to be expounded from the sacred text during the course of the liturgical year. As a part of the liturgy itself, therefore, the homily is strongly recommended. In fact, at Mass is celebrated with the assistance of the people on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, it is not to be omitted, except for a very serious reason. And 107. The liturgical year is to be so revised that the traditional customs and usages of the sacred seasons are preserved or restored to suit the conditions of modern times. Their specific character is to be retained so that they may duly nourish the devotion of the faithful who celebrate the mysteries of Christ's redemption and above all, the Paschal mystery. If certain adaptations are considered necessary on account of local conditions, they are to be made in accordance with the provisions of Article 39 and 40, which deal with adaptation. Sounds kind of Protestant, doesn't it? Um, for us as Roman Catholics, this is revolutionary. As I look back at all the liturgical reform and renewal that has proceeded since the council, the most important thing has been the lectionary. 
all the other things are nice, but the lectionary has transformed the Catholic Church and Catholics. They now hear the majority of the New Testament over a period of three Sunday, three year cycle. They hear the most important passages of the Old Testament. Catholics did not hear the Old Testament, did not read the Old Testament. Catholics did not hear most of the epistles of Paul or the other apostles. And so this has been a wonderful way of allowing people to become acquainted with the scriptures who never were. For me, it is the most important thing. Well, what is this lectionary? First of all, it is not meant to be the thing that holds all the value of the liturgy together. It's part of it. As Catholic Christians, we celebrate the Eucharist every week. The Roman lectionary is a Eucharistic lectionary. It depends upon the liturgical year. And it presumes music and all the other things that go around the liturgy, they're all integrated together as one. And so one of the things that is common question of the common lectionary in its revision is that some communities, the readings are the most important thing and the Eucharist is not celebrated. And therefore the lectionary's use is quite different. So keep in mind that for those of us of the liturgical tradition, that celebrate the Eucharist frequently, if not every Sunday, the lectionary is part of that whole composite. Uh, the reform of the liturgical year in the count calendar also have to be understood as being part of the lectionary. And that's why when the common lectionary was published, there was also published uh, a new ordering of the liturgical year for many communities, it meant they had to change uh, the patterns of the past. And so uh, the seasons of the liturgical year, uh, in a sense, dictate how the lectionary was formed. One of my professors in Rome, uh, Father Adrian Nosat, may he rest in peace, uh, we used to call him Sister Gladys, <laughs> because he uh, could be like a little old lady sometimes. Uh, Father Nosat never was in a parish his whole life as a priest until the course of marriage. He never performed a marriage. <laughs> However, those are parts of life. He was on the committee, the Chaitus, as it's called in Latin, that did the lectionary. And if you have an opportunity, his original uh, series of the liturgical year which was one of the first commentaries from the Roman point of view on the lectionary, contained some history about how the lectionary was formed, and it's been republished by Liturgical Press. It's called The Liturgical Year, it's three volumes by Father Adrian Nosat. If you want to know the historical facts, you want to know about the Wurzburg lectionary, you want to know about the combs and the other things that are uh, preceding the lectionary. If you want to know about the relationship between the Eastern liturgies and the Roman liturgy, and the, also the non-Roman Western liturgies, Nosat has all kinds of stuff here. So this is a, a nice resource in English for those who want to know the history of the lectionary and the preaching of God's word. Well, let's talk a little bit about how the lectionary was put together. As we heard, there was one cycle of readings uh, that came down to us through history. The uh, Lutherans and Anglicans essentially kept the Roman pattern, changed it sometimes for particular reasons. But it meant that uh, there was a rather limited portion of the Word of God proclaimed. Those of you who come from free liturgical traditions know sometimes the preacher would preach on one verse, or even sometimes part of a verse. Um, the Second Vatican Council indicated that that's not sufficient. We need a greater diet of scripture in the liturgy, which in realistically looked at means that 
that's the place where most people are going to hear the scriptures and read them. And so they set about looking at the old lectionaries to see what was done. For example, the reading of the Acts of the Apostles during the Easter season comes from the Eastern Church. What they tried to do was look at the different patterns. And what comes out is a three-year cycle, each year based on one of the uh, Gospels, year A, Matthew, year B, Mark, year C, Luke. We are using year C at the present time. And the Gospel of John was used at particular times within those three years, especially during the Easter and uh, uh, Christmas seasons. Um, some had thought that maybe there should be a year of St. John, but that never really gained much traction in the discussions. And especially because John's Gospel has a lot of difficulties attached to it. Um, when we read some of the material during this season of Easter from John, um, one has to sometimes be a bit apologetic and give a lot of background for people to understand it. And so the three Gospels, the synoptics, were used and, and chosen. Uh, a general reading or a general purpose uh, for the use of the scriptures was to integrate them so that the gospel was the primary reading and that the reading from the Old Testament would in some way complement the gospel. And during the major or strong seasons, uh, at Advent, uh, Christmas, Lent, Easter, the second reading would be taken from one of the letters of Paul or the other epistles and would also be related to the gospel reading or to the first reading. Uh, the use of um, typology lies at the core of this. It is a traditional way in the Western church of dealing with the scriptures. Biblical scholars today probably are too thrilled with it. We know they're not because when we're doing a common lectionary, revisions, uh, often uh, the Biblicists, especially the Old Testament people, wanted the Old Testament reading to be on its own and not have to deal with the Gospel. But as Catholic Christians, we read the Gospel because it tells us something of Christ, and we read the other readings because they too somehow help us to understand what Christ has said and done. Now, obviously, this is not accepted by everybody. And so uh, the thematic use of the Old Testament uh, <coughs> caused us in the common lecture to have to provide two different ways of healing, handling uh, the other scripture readings. And you'll hear a lot of that from, uh, from Fritz West. The uh, other parts of the year, outside the, the major seasons, uh, were given the rather prosaic title of the uh, season during the year or ordinary time. Life is ordinary time. And so uh, that's kind of how it, the title got in there. Uh, nothing major being celebrated other than the teaching and preaching of Christ in his ministry. So that underlies the period after Epiphany and the period uh, to before Lent and the period uh, after um, the Easter season, after Pentecost, up to the beginning of uh, Advent. That meant uh, the liturgical year no longer had the pre-Lenten season, and the Roman liturgical year no longer had the season of Epiphany. Uh, in one sense, that is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, some still might want to call uh, the season after Epiphany, season after Epiphany, and the season after Pentecost, the season of Pentecost. Uh, but uh, at least in the Latin church, the Roman church, the, those terms have pretty much disappeared. And younger people don't even remember them. So uh, Pentecost as a feast ending the Easter season uh, is really the only usage that we use of that terminology. Also, the, ter the season of Easter was extended uh, so that it continued through Pentecost. And then we kind of dribble on. We have Trinity Sunday in Corpus Christi. And so um, that's one of the 
not greater parts of uh, the Church of the Reform because uh, we keep kind of having major feasts that follow the Easter season but really aren't connected to anything. They're kind of freestanding. So first of all then, the liturgical year is the framework around which the lectionary is established. The uh, material I gave you uh, will tell you near the end of why certain things are done in certain seasons. I think that's useless for me to do now. You can read it yourselves. Uh, but what is important is to see there is a plan for the readings. And you can go through this and it tells you exactly why choices were made. That was important for the common lectionary because the common lectionary uh, had to look at that and then decide whether they wanted to keep the same emphasis. Um, just to mention, because it may not be mentioned otherwise, the uh, readings in the Roman lectionary were adapted a bit so that uh, insofar as possible, there was some echo of the readings in particular seasons. However, the Roman collects tend to be rather generic and really don't always really look at the, the readings of the day, even in the old lectionary. So there were some new collects written, but uh, basically the collect stands alone. That's true even more so for the prayers after communion because they simply say the same thing over and over again. They really can't say very much more than that. Uh, and so anybody who's trying to write post-communion prayers without difficulties. The CCT uh, produced a book containing prayers for the common lectionary. Several different series, one based on each of the three-year cycle of the lectionary, as well as uh, collects that could be used for the one-year cycle or for different occasions, intercessions and Thanksgiving. So this is another resource for those of you who aren't bound to use uh, what your church provides. Uh, and it is related to the lectionary. Or in fact, uh, we've produced three books on lectionary, the revised common lectionary, the uh, prayers for the common lectionary, and a daily lectionary. So those of you who aren't familiar might take a look at those things. Uh, you can look at our, the CCD website to get the references where you can get them, um, mainly from Augsburg Fortress. Probably the easiest thing is, um, I'm going to just say that's enough. And as the common lectionary is spoken about by Fritz, and he has so, a lots of uh, slides for you to see uh, some of the issues between the two lectionaries will be brought forth. So uh, if you have any questions later on, I'll be happy to answer them. But the main thing is the first group that used the common the lectionary, the Roman lectionary, after it was published, were Presbyterians of all things. The second group was uh, Episcopalians, Anglicans, and then Lutherans. And then Methodists and everybody else got on the bandwagon. That led to the common lectionary. So yes, uh, as we just said, the uh, Roman lectionary is the father and mother of the common lectionary, and uh, we're very happy for us as Catholics to be able to point out that uh, we now preach the gospel from the Word of God, and that the Word of God is extremely important for us. I think it's rather novel. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Fritz West will now come and uh, present to us on the revised common lectionary. I know David is handing out some materials as well, so you'll receive those shortly. Uh, Fritz does also have some slides, so uh, from time to time, uh, pay attention to the screen for those who will be watching online. Um, I will try to move the camera to capture the screen occasionally, um, and we will go from there. My uh, beloved wife, Cynthia, 
cause a contrast between myself and her. She is uh, barely enough, and I'm over the top. So I buy I buy a gallon of milk, and she buys a pint. Um, and I am uh, overwhelmed what I'm, what, with what I need to present here. Just I'm sure it's Alan was and others uh, how much there is to present. So I have. Are we up? Um, I, I I have developed a very thorough handout. Uh, I'm going to be moving through this pretty fairly quickly. Uh, and if you want to um, follow up with more, uh, there's the handout to be done. So how do we uh, we advance with the so what I'm going to be doing is uh, offering a, a hermeneutic uh, and uh, in, uh, offering a critical view of the revised Tama lectionary from that hermeneutic. So I'm going to begin with the hermeneutic, move to a comparison of the revised Tama uh, and the Roman lectionary, Ordo Lectionum Mise, uh, and then conclude with some critical comments on the uh, revised common lectionary. So the pastor of human hermeneutics, the key is a coherence. The question is, uh, what principles of perception does uh, an assembly bring to the celebration of the liturgy congregation bring uh, to the worship event? What are the propensities? And what propensities of perception do they employ when they're hearing scriptural readings proclaimed? And I argue that it's propensity for coherence. It's a whole, a coherence of related parts rather than, and this is the word that you'll need to have on the test, galena free, it's a wonderful word, confused jumble or medley of things. And the coherence is aesthetic. And so we have aesthetic coherence in a poem. This is a haiku, a famous haiku by Matsuta Masahide. Since my house burned down, I now own a better view of the rising moon. You have their words, you have rhythm, you have number, you have sonority. You have all of those things working together to create an aesthetic coherence, as one does with music, as one does, and these are going to be my examples, uh, with a visual or material work of art. So here we have our friend George Washington crossing the Delaware. I just took a classic painting, it could be any painting, and you look at it in terms of the color of the shape of the foreshortening uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the patterns that you have laid out, both of color and shape, uh, and it all works together to create a whole. Now my suggestion is hermeneutically that this is what people assume or presume as they went in to go into worship, and what they presume as they listen to readings. Now, a painting can be attenuated, and here is a famous painting from Picasso of the a girl with the mandolin. You recognize the girl, you recognize the mandolin, but there's a good deal of tension in this. It's not simply a, uh, uh, a realistic depiction, but the, the parts are there. You can hold them together in your own perception. Whereas when you go to the surrealism of Dali, this brings us to modern art where it is we, the viewer, that must assemble the parts. This is a glimmery. This has Catalan Hills uh, uh, in, in the background. It has watches which are shaped like melted camembert cheese, as he said. There are ants climbing on the face of the, of the, of the uh, pink or red watch. There's this odd figure lying in the foreground. What does it mean? Well, people discuss it forever. But in terms of itself, it does not itself contain the kind of aesthetic coherence that one has in the paintings that we saw before. You have to work at it. The means by which the lectionaries hold, the three-year lectionaries, hold together this, these, this coherence the agency of coherency is Christological memory. Christians hold scripture in Christological memory. Now, it is my argument that if baptism means anything, we are enlightened with the mind of Christ. And if we are enlightened with the mind of Christ, we perceive scripture through 
the eyes that we have been given. So we have here a, um, a calligraphy. This is a very important calligraphy to me. I gave it as a gift to a Presbyterian minister who had helped me out when I was serving uh, First Congregational Church in Madison, Wisconsin. We were at dinner with uh, this Presbyterian minister, his wife, myself, my wife, and the rabbi and his wife in town. I was giving this to uh, Bill, the Presbyterian minister, as Thanksgiving, and the rabbi said, can I look at it, please? I said, sure. And he looked at it in silence for a long time. And it was the first time, I confess, that I had seen it through his eyes. He was saying a scripture that we had appropriated into our Christological memory by the simple use of taking the sword and making it to a cross. Now, I don't think this is as obscene as putting a cross outside Auschwitz uh, and claiming Auschwitz for the Christian church suffering. It is a claiming of scripture, which is typical of the development of religions uh, in the Abrahamic faiths in particular. You have the Jewish scripture, which appropriated Babylonian myth, appropriated other stories. It incorporated that which in, in its environment, which was not Jewish of origin. There's the Christian faith that incorporated the Old Testament. There's Islam that incorporates elements of the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is simply a process whereby each subsequent um, revelation, if you will, each subsequent uh, interpretation of scripture appropriates that which comes before Christological memory and so I say the Christian church reads Christian scripture now I know there's a great deal of debate about whether one should call for example uh, that which we read uh, in worship Hebrew scripture now if you're talking about scripture that was written in Hebrew I understand what is being said but the Old Testament, when read in the church, is Christian scripture. Context says so. Our baptism says so. I use the term first covenant, the uh, first, uh, first testament. The first testament, the second testament. Giving it due and honor. And of course, understanding, just as I did when my, when my rabbi friend looked at that, that there are other eyes to see. I don't mean to. Uh, appropriate that. But just to say that within the Christian liturgy, we read Christian scripture. So let's look at uh, the OLM, Ordo Lectio Missae, Lectionary for Mass, Roman Lectionary, as compared to the Revised Common Lectionary. The commonalities. Alan has already quoted this passage, uh, paragraph 51 of the uh, Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy. This is also bedrock to the Revised Common Lectionary. This is a commonality that we hold with the Roman Lectionary. There are a number of things that Alan lifted up as well. The two employ the same liturgical year or very nearly. And key to this is these two segments of the year, one being the seasons and the other one being the rest, whatever you wish to call it, uh, which is interrupted by Easter, but is understood to be a unity. That's in contrast to every other lectionary I know. There are other things. I won't go on. Assign biblical literary units at various times. Now, the obvious one is synoptics in three years, but you also have Revelations, 1 John and 1 Peter at Easter. You have Acts at Easter. You have John around Christmas and Easter time and so forth. So it is using biblical literary units as a building block to the lectionary. This too is an innovation, and it too is a commonality. When it points reading semi-continuously over Sundays, that is true, of course, uh, for the synoptics and for uh, the epistles in ordinary time, uh, also at other times at Easter and so on. It employs both related and unrelated readings. Now the first, the one-year lectionary, employs only related readings, and in a development of that, that lectionary, that is the German lectionary, uh, they have expanded this to a six-year six system, 
that the whole thing on a given Sunday is related to a given memory. The fact that there are unrelated readings in the Roman and the Revised Common is uh, something to note. And that, as I said, the readings are related primarily through Christological memory. Okay. There are contrasts of lectionary, calendar, pericopes, Sunday verse, uh, coherence versus biblical narrative, ecclesiology, theological emphasis, and sensitivities. So let's look at them. The key thing for the revised common lectionary is that it's not a lectionary in the historic sense. It is a lectionary resource by which a person can create a lectionary, by which a congregation can create a lectionary, by which a church can create a lectionary. We have all these choices. The big one, obviously, of the two series uh, in the seasons uh, after, uh, in the season of uh, season after Pentecost. Um, but there are other choices as well. When you put when you put Transfiguration, you use readings for the Apocrypha, or do you not use them? What the various nomenclatures, etc. There are all kinds of choices in there. And the fact that this is a offering to the church to build a lectionary, I think, is key to the character of the Revised Common Lectionary. It invites us into that process. It does not lay something upon us. It invites us into the process of creation. The calendar. The key difference between the Roman and the Revised Common Lectionary calendar is that we reintroduced the seasons with the Revised Common Lectionary. One now has, has the uh, season after Epiphany, excuse me, the season of Epiphany and the season after Pentecost. So now every single Sunday falls into a season in the Revised Common Lectionary, which is not the case in the Roman Lectionary, which has the seasonal cycles, Sundays of the seasons and Sundays of the year, this stark contrast, which I think is very um, provocative. Uh, and it's interesting the Revised Common Lectionary has gone back to, if you will, seasonify uh, or season time. The pericopes, as we know, they are shorter and they are ex excerpted surgically in the Roman. Uh, they are longer and they are excerpted contextually in the Revised Common. Sunday coherence versus biblical narrative. Uh, the Roman maintains the Sunday coherence, save for the Sunday continuous readings of the epistles on Sunday of the year. The Revised Common Lectionary has gone further with their option after Pentecost. Coherence on a Sunday versus biblical narrative, the, the, the classic tension of any, uh, of any lectionary. Ecclesiology, this is stretching it just a little bit, <laughs> but if you look at the reading for Acts that are chosen for the Roman and for the Revised Common, you will find a striking difference. The ones in uh, in the Roman lectionary prefer Peter uh, and do not give the most, uh, what do I want to say, telling or fulsome passages to Paul. Uh, the Revised Common Lectionary corrects what I understand to be an imbalance and has a balance between the Petri and the Pauline passages. If you want to make that into ecclesiology, then maybe that's making too much of it, but I, I, I note that. Uh, theological emphasis. Alan spoke of the Paschal Mystery, that the Roman lectionary is a uh, Eucharistic lectionary. The Revised Common Lectionary is not. Can be, depending on the choices you make. Need not be. And because of that, the, the theological emphasis shifts from Christocentric toward the theocentric, especially by virtue of the uh, readings in the semi-continuous series after uh, Pentecost. And finally, sensitivities. What were the sensitivities, by which I don't mean the bedrock theological understandings, but what were the external sensitivities uh, that were brought to bear upon the creation of these lectionaries? The one that was uh, very uh, important to uh, OLM, or the Roman lectionary, was the mission field and catechesis. Uh, the RCIA was developed simultaneous with the lectionary. Uh, year A is specifically designed to be to lead people to baptism. Uh, people in the mission field said, look, we need to have some way to have catechesis for people in Africa and Asia and so forth. And that had an impact 
on creating the Roman lectionary. Uh, when the revised common lectionary came about, the issues came to bear. There were feminist issues and concerns about Judaism, as well as disabilities, as well as color, and so forth. But especially the feminist and uh, Jewish concerns. Whoops, look what I should have been doing. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so pericopes and how they relate. Pericopes. Just as members of the assembly congregation have a propensity to perceive aesthetic coherence in the liturgy, so do they regard pericopes. Here we have the standard definition of pericope that we're all familiar with. A set of verses from a text suitable for public reading that forms one coherent unit or thought. Pericopes acquire an aesthetic dimension. Here's a quote from Northrop Fry. Once a verbal structure is read and reread, often enough to be possessed, it freezes. It turns into a unity in which all parts exist at once, which we can then examine as a picture without regard to the specific movement of the narrative. And then he also lifts this up in terms of music as well. He also could have, in terms of poetry, aesthetic coherence. So, let me go back here. We can go through the passion narrative and, without telling any story at all, recognize uh, the flow of the narrative by seeing the various uh, pictures of various pericopes as we go through. So, here we have. Enter to Jerusalem. Pericope becomes icon. We can understand these very well read, or these very frequently read and familiar uh, readings as icons. So pericopes and how they relate. How do they relate? Just as members of the assembly, uh, the assembly or congregation have a propensity to perceive aesthetic coherence, in the liturgy and pericope, so do they tend to discern aesthetic relationships between multiple pericopes. So, let's we'll go through the various ways they do this. Again, the RCL employs Christological memory to relate pericopes one to another. The reservoir of memory is Christological. And what the lectionary does, and this is on a feast day, when they all relate, is it launches the readings, little sailboats, to float upon the reservoir of memory. They might come very close to one another. They might bump. They may be unrelated within the biblical text completely, but because of the memory, they are related. An example, the readings for Trinity Sunday. Uh, this is your A. So you have the great commandment, you have the uh, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and so forth from love of God, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, by Paul, and one has Genesis in which you have God, the wind or spirit, and word. Now we all know that the doctrine of the Trinity postdates the biblical text. None of these have to do with Trinity in and of themselves. But when they're brought into relationship on the Christological or the Trinitarian memory, they come to inform us about the Trinity. We launch them onto that reservoir of memory. 
And so we have Rublev's icon, bringing together uh, in, in the, in, in these, uh, these readings are brought together in, in, in an uh, icon like this to give us an understanding of um, the Trinity. Okay, in RCL, readings are iconically laid one upon the other. If we go to Advent 4C, we have the visitation, which can be extended to include the Magnificat. Uh, one has a passage from um, Micah 5, which refers to Bethlehem and a woman's labor. And then one has, interestingly, a passage from Hebrews 10, connecting Jesus with Israel and sacrifice and Christ's sacrifice upon the cross. Now, what's going on here? This is what I suggest. Here we have a painting of Bellini. You have the Madonna. You have the Madonna in the... Lucan passage. Uh, here you have the child on a banana's lap in the position of the Pieta. There's this odd disconnect between Mary and the child. I mean, Mary seems more oriented toward, uh, toward God than the child. It's a very tensive picture. But my point is this, that that Hebrews is laid upon the gospel to give us a cruciform understanding of the birth of Christ, just like that painting. And this can happen because the pericopes are iconic. This pattern of laying, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, uh, is found in the Christmas cycle, where you layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, one understanding of Christ after another, and you then move through that cycle. I have a whole chapter of this in my book, Scripture and Memory. I'm not going to unpack it for you, but this is where that functions. Readings iconically are juxtaposed to one another. So here we have Transfiguration. Uh, in, trans in Transfiguration A, uh, you have Transfiguration from Matthew, you have uh, Peter's eyewitness account from 2 Peter, uh, and then you have a parallel narr narrative about Moses on Mount Sinai. Here is Raphael's picture of the Transfiguration. Above you have the Transfiguration. And below you have the disciples being confronted with a, a boy who has an unclean spirit, and they don't know what to do <laughs> right after the transfiguration they don't know what to do they wait for Christ the point here is that you have a juxtaposition of stories this is not juxtaposition in the in the lectionary there you have the juxtaposition of the Mathean text on the one hand and the Exodus text on the other but the point is that you juxtapose iconic pericopes to one another, and then they start interacting on a given Sunday. This is done in the Easter cycle. Now, this happens to be year B, but any year, where you have stories that are juxtaposed one to another. Viewed through a Christic lens. Now, we've already talked about this a bit. Just one example of the complementary uh, readings. Uh, we have uh, proper five year C, uh, Luke telling of Jesus raising the son of the widow of Nain, and coupled with the story of Elijah, Elijah raising the son of the widow of Zarephath. Now, in this, the suggestive raising on the part of Elijah is understood to be related, identical to the raising power of Christ. I, we need to work with that. But the point being that the Old Testament text is read through a Christic lens. And here I return to this. I, I, there are other paintings that are more involved, but I'm just, for sake of time, I'm just returning to this, saying what we are doing here is reading, reading the text through our Christological memory. This is the case with complementary readings where you have Gospel and O to O T tied together. The line indicates the semi-continuous nature of it, and the epistle being separate. Finally, they are hung side by side. This pattern is found on all Sundays when the semi-continuous series is employed 
uh, in the season after Pentecost. And here you have the three parallel, semi-continuous readings. I can't give you an example because they're unrelated. But you know the pattern. It's like a museum. It's like taking paintings and hanging the museum. It's like going into a gallery where you have different paintings hung next to one another. They're all paintings like they're all readings, but they're not essentially related to each other. They're just hung uh, out of the uh, aesthetic church history interest of the uh, museum period. There's no intrinsic relationship of them to one another. So in summary, the revised common lecture accommodates in varying degrees the assembly's uh, uh, the assembly congregation's propensity to perceive coherence. Christmas, Easter, cycles, and feasts fully. All readings are related. Season Epiphany uh, and with the complementary uh, First Testament readings in the season after Pentecost, partial. Gospel and First Testament are related, epistles are not related. With the semi continuous First Testament readings in the season after Easter, not at all. Does not respond to that propensity for coherence with which people come into a liturgical event. Gospel, epistle, First Testament readings are not related. Thank you. Thank you. Taylor, there's one thing I need to add. Yes, that I, I go ahead. I'd like you to mention. So come up here. Thank you, Fritz. Alan has something to add, and then we'll continue with uh, Tim's presentation. The lectionary consists of three readings, but actually four readings. Right. We forget the psalm. The psalm is an extremely important part, and in many cases, it's the link between the first reading and the other readings. It is a response to the first reading, uh, and uh, it is specifically in the Roman lectionary designed as a way that the people participate in the liturgy of the word. Ideally, it should be sung, or at least to be some musical part of it. The Roman lectionary provides all kinds of different ways of doing it. Uh, it can be read straight through by a reader. It can be sung straight through. It can be used with an antiphon at the beginning and the end, or a refrain uh, at the beginning and after each of the verses. Uh, so there's a great deal of variety. It doesn't have to be done like the old gradual used to be done. But it is an important part of the whole complex. And uh, the common lectionary following the Roman lectionary try to assign appropriate psalms, which are not always the same as the Roman lectionary, so that the uh, the, the use of the, the Psalter uh, is extremely important as part of the whole picture of the lectionary. Thank you, Alan. And uh, Fritz, do you want to say anything about the Psalter and the RCL, or would you say that they're pretty much a similar kind of? Okay, that's good. Uh, we're going to take about a 10 minute break, and uh, as we're about to uh, we're going to shift the screen over so that it's a bit more accessible to our presenter who won't then have to turn quite as far to see it. Uh, and uh, so if you would plan to be back here at about 25 after, if you want to take a break, and uh, we will continue with Tim Slumman's presentation at that time. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we'll see if we can. We need to use it for those. Okay. I just wanted to see what were you using to webcast. This is uh, well, this actually you're on you're on screen right now. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, we're doing. Um, let's see. 